Uh, so we've been going down that road because it looks less regulated. It's an interesting road to go down. It is less regulated, and there. So I have friends in this space, and uh, and many of them have told me there's going to be a couple of wonder things that come out of this because it's really just a biological agent producing a chemical. So you're still doing chemistry at its core. Yeah. But that a huge amount of what's going to get sold into the system probably already has been sold in the system is snake oil. So how yeah. are you yeah. present preventing yourself from? from uh the, the sweet sweet alcohol of your own brew yeah yeah these so these enzymes are chitinases and thaumatine like proteins um these things decay beta glucan the thaumatine proteins decay beta glucan which is in the cell wall of fungi and the chitinases hit chitin and so when you hit them with both of those the fungal walls dissolve and um it's actually the most highly expressed gene in cannabis is the chitinase uh, at least the plants that we've been sequencing. So the gene is already turned on full charge. Because it was confronted with this in the wild in the past, yeah. huh? Yeah, okay. and, and interestingly enough, it doesn't express it in the roots. Like the root system has zero expression of this. And I think that's because the roots need to talk to mycorrhizal fungi. And so they don't want to be emitting something that melts fungi. What is uh, the history of, of cannabis? Do you know how it became domesticated? That is a very good question. Um, it, there's a lot of uh, history and folklore there, but I think the, I think it's the tombs in China. Ethan Russo is probably the best person to talk to, and then I can connect you with him if you ever want to get into the ethnobotany. Um, John McPartland's another good name on this. Um, and they were, they found psychoactive THC in tombs in China that I think were like five thousand years old. All right, so that they were able to, they were able to PCR. The, the cannabis that they found in these tombs to know that the THC gene was there. Therefore, it wasn't just fiber type. And so, and it was a grave. So a ceremony, they can see that they probably packed some of the stuff into the grave as a ceremony. So we know, we know that far back. Um, the, the pollen record suggests it diverged uh, like 20 million years ago, maybe from hops. Uh, and uh, so it's got an old pollen record, but we don't have, we can't get DNA that's that old. So um, I think the oldest DNA sequences out there are probably for the Denisovans. That might be like 100,000 years old. Um, I could be behind on some of that, that paleogenomics work, but it's, we, we don't have good ability to sequence DNA that's, that's you know, a million years old at the moment. So uh, we, we, can, we can PCR stuff that's thousands of years old, not a problem. And, you know, 100,000 years old, there are the ways to do it. But when you go deep, deeper into this, it's a bit harder to get DNA out of it. Um, but anyway, it, did, it wasn't here. There's no evidence it was in North America. The evidence is that it came out of, of the Hindu Kush area and then spread around the globe in an equatorial sense. Um, in fact, it was used to create the fiber uh, for the sales. So canvas sales, the can in canvas is for cannabis. No way. Yeah, yeah so oh. James, James Cook actually introduced cannabis to Australia because he carried cannabis seeds with him everywhere he went in case his sales got wrecked. He'd plant these things and they grow within eight, eight to 10 weeks, recreate his fiber. He could remake his sales and, and move on. Um, so all the cannabis that's in Australia is presumed to have come from James Cook. Um, and it, how, when it got to America's is, is an unknown. Um, I, I don't know that if, I don't have good uh, visibility on that, but it, it's not believed to have been here until ships brought it here. So it was the naval, it was the whale oil of, of the naval industry and, and the human diaspora was really powered by cannabis. Uh, so it's gone with us all over the globe and intermixed for a long period of time. So people have been smoking it for that long or, or predominantly I, yeah, using it for the fibers? It's a good question. I, I don't know um, when that aspect was discovered. Um, you know, it was certainly in, in the, uh, you know, being used in, uh, for, for seed and fiber for a long period of time. But I don't know when someone decided to smoke it. That's a, uh, we have evidence of that tomb 5,000 years ago. So I would assume that was prior to a lot of these ships moving all over the place. So people on those ships probably knew about its, uh, its psychoactive effects as well. Kevin, you find me, you find me the expert on this and we will have the greatest yeah. conversation because what, what an interesting plant and for it to, the thing that strikes me is there's very few things in this world that want to draw attention to themselves as much as that plant does because it smells so strongly yeah. when it's ready to to be harvested that it's 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 unimaginable if you're so i used to live in mendocino you could be walking around in the woods and smell something and people would be like well that's several miles away yeah yeah and don't don't walk over there by the way you might get a yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah those are the terpenes that the plant makes and um those are important essential oils as well a lot of the terpenes like beta carophylline is one that's quite common in cannabis and is known to be a cannabinoid two agonist. So even things that aren't cannabinoids in the plant 
have some activity on the endocannabinoid system. And what uh, are terpenes? Yeah, to, for people that haven't been into a smoke shop to see like, the, the, this is the terpene profile. Yeah, so terpenes are smaller molecular weight molecules. They're, they're, um, the plant makes a lot of these uh, six and eight carbon chain molecules that kind of glues those things together into a variety of, of different compounds that are, that are volatile. Volatile meaning they, they, they um, vape off into the air and you can smell them from long distances away. But they're believed to be signaling molecules um, that are used to either fight off, you know, pesticide, you know, you know other insects, or, or also maybe even attract things that might move its seed around. So, um, a really good paper um, to go and read is from David Sinclair on this. David Sinclair, you may know, is one someone who's been working on the Fountain of Youth for a long time. He's published a lot on Reversitol, uh, and he's been on Joe Rogan's podcast a few times. He does really good work out of Harvard. Um, he published a really good paper on xenohormesis, which is this concept that plants um, make chemical messengers to attract the things that might move their seed around. Okay, so uh, terpenes are, are in that category, that they're building these compounds to not only be an insecticide, but they're also meant to attract humans to perhaps, or other mammals to perhaps engage with this plant and move it around. But as a result of this, they tend to have really interesting signaling to the organisms that eat them. Um, they're known to, to, to play around in the pathway in the human body known as the mTOR pathway. mTOR is uh, involved in your metabolism. So his theory is that when the plants start to sense environmental stress, they change their terpene profile so that the things that are consuming them get a signal that prepare for caloric restriction, I'm going away. Uh, and it's adapted to do this in theory so that the thing that's spreading its seed gets a signal from the environment to prepare for change so that its partner in transmission of its genetics is actually receiving some chemical messengers to make it, um, to, you know, to, to make it better prepared. That paper will blow your mind. This, this sounds remarkably similar. I have uh, good friends that are in the pepper breeding and I actually heard one of the, oh, one yeah. of the world's great pepper breeders said that when they started uh, breeding jalapenos, uh, they put it in the best conditions they could possibly get, right? Perfectly watered, lots of sun, protecting it. And they found out that the Scovilles of these, on these jalapenos were going down, down, down. Wow. Because the way that the, the chemical that the seeds produce, capsaicin, which, you know, is that really spi spicy chemical, it is uh, increased when the plant is stressed. Yes, and this so is true. Yeah. You have to go out and like break branches. You have to hold withhold water, and that's the plight of the of the um, pepper breeder, the pepper, because you've got to um, balance yeah. that out. And I believe yeah. they think it's epigenetic. So if you are stressed parents, then you give children Maybe. that end up being more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite possible. We, you know, we're just starting to get into epigenetics and cannabis. We just published um, some of the first methylation maps in cannabis. Um, and plant methylation is more complicated than mammalian methylation. They, they, uh, mammals tend to methylate only... What is seed. methylation? So in, in DNA, um, ATCs and Gs can transmit through sexual reproduction into the offspring. The, 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 um, the cells that, that contain those in the plant can have some memory. They, they can write messages on the DNA based on the environment, but that message doesn't always get transmitted. All right, so when they do this in the form of methylation. They'll come onto the cytosines and they'll put a, a methyl group on it. And that methyl group, when the polymerase copies the DNA into the next generation, it doesn't copy the methyl group. So the methylation patterns are not um, replicable necessarily into the, meth into the next generation. Some of them can be, but it's, it's a much more subtle effect than the copying you get on the ATCs and Gs. So you have to think of the, when the environment wants to paint its picture onto DNA, it's doing it with methylation. Right, the, the environment gets printed onto DNA based on methylation patterns. And the plants have more ways to methylate DNA than humans do. We tend to only methylate Cs that are next to Gs. Plants can do almost any C in the genome, they can methylate. And so the methylation patterns are far more complicated and we, we don't fully understand them in cannabis yet. Um, but we're starting to do this for that reason because you're absolutely right. In cannabis, if you want to get the terpene profile up and the cannabinoid profile up, you need to stress that plant. Uh, and its secondary metabolism kicks in and starts making all types of different molecules uh, when it's stressed. Um, this is why they try not to seed them. So if you really want to get cannabinoid content up, you keep pollen away from the female plants. And the female plants start to stress out because they're getting late in their life cycle and they're worried they're not going to make a seed. And so they start making more cannabinoids and more terpenes and the, and the flowers get bigger. 
Uh, and so one way of, of stressing these plants out is pushing them into late of their growth and, and keep pollen completely away from them. And then they end up getting really large flowers. Whoa. So you're, you're absolutely right. Same thing's going on in peppers. And it's a very similar pathway. I think capsaicin is probably in, in the, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a terpene pathway in there that's making capsaicin. Uh, the, so the terpenes, um, they're, they're very small volatile molecules. Um, the building blocks that make terpenes are also utilized to make larger molecules like cannabinoids. Uh, cannabinoids are like 21, comp 21 carbon molecules, and the terpenes are usually like half that or less. So there, there, um, there is some competition there that when you get changes in terpene profiles, th th those will change to the environment much more quickly than the cannabinoid content will because the cannabinoids are like 10 enzymatic steps downstream. And so when you get a change in the environment, the terpenes will change first and the cannabinoids will get, their, their change will be much more delayed like a few weeks later. So there's a bit of a, um, a queuing theory issue there and, and getting the cannabinoids to move around a lot with the, with the environment, but the terpenes you can change instantly. And you, there are even papers out there that if you, um, there's a dance with these things with the microbes that if you actually antibiotic treat the flowers, this wasn't done in cannabis, it was done on Rabidopsis. But if you antibiotic treat the flowers and wipe out the microbiome, terpene profile completely changes. Wow. So, so they're that much in a dance between, yes. between uh, what's going on all the way down at the roots and the microbiome. Wow. Yeah, there are unique terpenes that are made in the roots too that we don't see in the flowers. Um, this is uh, Keith Allen published some of this work. Um, he was working with the reference that we made on Jamaican lion and profiled all, all the uh, terpene synthase genes, beautiful paper. And he noticed that there's a few of these terpenes that are exclusively expressed in the roots and we don't know what the hell they are. So you have a very precise and nuanced way of looking at how the environment impacts these chemicals and these microbes. And you're thinking about this on a very deep level, but what if we zoomed the camera lens way, way, way back. And instead of looking at what is it doing to the individual human mind, what, it, what happens when a culture now gets a hold of this chemical in mass or these chemicals in mass in a way that they never have before? What are the societal implications of this, of this being something we can grow on a scale we've never done before? Okay, so I think the first thing, we, it goes back to that mask thing, right? Um, you cannot, there, there's a tendency to do a one size fits all on the human population as well. That can, like THC does the same thing to everybody. It's not true. Uh, all right, there's, there's like 9% of the population that gets anxiety from THC. Um, and they believe it's associated with an AKT1 variant, but it's still early data. Uh, likewise, um, so I think it's just important to know when, when there's some generalization going on when people say, oh, THC gets everybody high and gets them stoned and they sit on their couch and eat Doritos. That's just it it has like a stimulation effect on me. It, it's almost like go. taking Adderall or something. Like, yeah. I, I never took Adderall, but I, the way that I hear other people describe it, for me, it is like extreme focus. I, I know people who do that as well. Like, they want to get stuff done. They have THC and they go to town and uh, clean the house and they, they end up like, you know, writing papers. This is, uh, it has a different effect. Some people couch locks them. Uh, and they, you know, they perhaps they become net Netflix junkies. But uh, so that's that's the first thing is, is to step back and realize human biology is also a different uh, glove, uh, hand in glove type of environment here. Uh, we did we published a paper on this um, for a while. We were sequencing lots of patients with epilepsy uh, to try and sort out which genes were involved in CBD helping epileptic patients. And what we quickly found there is that there are variants in the in the human population, the cannabinoid one receptor and a gene known as DAGLA, which is involved in making your own endocannabinoids. Your body makes cannabinoids, but they're, they don't look the same as the plant ones. The plant one is, is mimicking them just like opiates are mimicking endorphins. Cannabinoids are mimicking anandamide and 2-AG. Those are the compounds that your body makes that the plant tries to stealthily mimic. Uh, well, there's enzymes in your body that make those things and break those things down. And there are variants in the human population that alter the ability for those enzymes to properly function. So we published a paper demonstrating there were, there are people in the population that have those mutations and they tend to have a higher likelihood of getting migraines, getting headaches, seizures, host of these, these things. So um, I just want to be really clear that this is uh, it's not a one size fits all. There's some generalization. You'll hear people say that CBD does X and THC does Y, and there's some generalizations there that are true, but there are always there are always edge cases. Um, so when you're back to your question, when when people are engaged in taking these cannabinoids, it's very rare that they're taking a pure isolated compound. You know, they're usually taking a plant extract which has 
hundreds of compounds in them at varying concentrations or one that have been extracted so they're slightly enriched for more THC or CBD. But there's this long tail of other terpenes, cannabinoids, flavonoids that we don't really understand yet and what they do. But um, they, um, they're, they're very much delivering uh, a different experience every time. And I think that's, that's probably one reason why I think this is a very attractive market to recreational users is that um, much like wine, it's a very different flavor of every plant that you, that you visit. And every you know, concoction that you come up with, it's very rare that you come across a plant that's expressing exactly the same cannabinoid ratios and terpene ratios that you had before. And so you may have a very different experience um, you know, plant to plant. It's you know, like a boat ride is going to be different every time, right? It's, yeah, it yeah. may look a lot the same, but it's going to, it's going to wave around in the waves. It's going to handle differently. It's going to pick up the wind a little differently. All of them are just a little bit different. Yeah. And you know, this, this tends to scare people in the FDA because they're like, whoa, whoa, you're just doing random number generators on people's minds, man. You can't do that, you know? But, but the, you know, the, the, the history here, and I think it probably has to do with their evolution that we've been, you know, we, this is, they believe this is the first plant we ever domesticated. I mean, that's how far back it goes. So if that's the case, our genetics probably, well, you know, we, we're not seeing deaths from this. Probably Wait, did you say you think this is the first plant we ever domesticated? Yeah, if you, if you talk to folks like Ethan Russo and, and McPartland, that's what you see in the literature is this may be the first domesticated plant. I mean, you could imagine people being highly, highly motivated when they found out that there is this wild plant that can make you feel this way or have these ideas. I, I mean, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And then that, that's something that's pretty sticky. Uh, I mean, it's funny, we, we published our, our preprint on um, these 42 genomes that we sequenced, and the, the one area that a few people commented on is that we, we put in there that these cannabinoids and terpenes might be uh, responsible for attracting pollinators. And they all like threw bees at us, like, no, it's not true, bees only go to cannabis plants uh, at, at late in the year, and they don't really move it from male to female plants, they just eat the pollen and take it as a good food source, they're not at all a pollinator and this stuff is wind pollinated. And I had to remind them that you're forgetting about humans, right? The biggest pollinator in cannabis are humans and they <laughs> cannot tell me that we are not attracted to this plant. All right, it's the most, it's the most widely consumed illicit drug. Uh, it has definitely found a way to make us pollinate it. And if the bees aren't doing it, we are. Um, and, and I think that's, that's very true. Uh, we have carried this all over the globe for a reason, uh, whether it be the food fiber or the psychoactive effects. So it, it's um, a symbiotic uh, relationship in some way, right? In, in exactly. And that, that the is, plant would have adapted to what we, what, what the humans wanted and the ones that they gave humans what they wanted randomly got selected for yeah. many, many times over. Like imagine if the poppy plant made fiber, you know, would we have an opiate overdose problem right now if we were traveling all over the world with opiates or would have we created a population of people that just never died from opiates? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's it's just a thought experiment. Oh, but, that is a wild thought experiment that you had to select out for the humans that were going to um, have cannabis terrible reactions, but that's already been done. But now with poppies, we never did that because they were really only for one thing. Other, yeah. other, than, other than one drug that was probably discovered fairly late in its, in, in its relationship with humans. Man, I always thought it was total garbage a couple of years ago when people would talk about hemp and hemp plants and paper and and uh, string. And I think people oftentimes overemphasize things when it benefits them and kind of, sure. you know, but it, it really is. I mean, for you to tell me that sales were made from, from cannabis, like that is so mind blowing because that would mean that you could, you basically have a little factory that you just hold in your pocket and it's biologically, yeah. you know, it's, you just put it, the sun on and some water and bang, you've got a, you've got a fiber factory built. For yeah. And, and the, the genetics have diverged enough where the, the hemp plants are different genetics than the ones that might grow CBD or THC. Um, but that's natural. That's just people selecting over the years that they want really tall, lanky plants that make the fiber. There's different plants they want that make the seeds that are really big. And, and then the cannabis plants they, they, they make for making very large flowers have completely different genetics and morphology. I mean, they're really distant, actually. If you look at the distance between hemp and cannabis, uh, like drug type cannabis, I think we're finding like 15 or 16 million SNPs. Um, so it's, it's like 10 times the polymorphism rate 
that you would see between any two humans that you would see between a hemp plant and, and a, and a drug type cannabis plant. So separated quite a while ago. They're, they are, they're very different. Um, With the Devisonians, they, would it be before we were broken off from humans then? Oh, I, I haven't done, that's a good question on a molecular clock basis. I haven't done that. Um, I, we just know that they're much more, um, they're much more polymorphic at the moment, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to, I gotta ask you people about that. That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs>